We are here recording our very first podcast. And for all of you radio listeners, I suppose, we are filming all of this for YouTube. So if you want to check that out, it is on Bomber Fitness YouTube channel. Yeah, welcome to the show, guys. We're excited to share with you the really the first podcast we want it to be more about like who we are and uh, where we got started prior to us meeting. Yeah, so this first episode is Josh before Sarah and Sarah before Josh. Episode two will be how we met, who hit on who, what the pickup line was, all <laughs> the fun stuff. But this one is just about laying the foundation from how we grew up, where we grew up, our education, our business background, our basically our background before we met each other. Yeah, so uh, why don't you kick this off? You know, I know everybody really wants to know all the details about Sarah Bomar and perhaps even Sarah Bacon prior to Bomar. Right. That's one of the reasons I got married was to get rid of that last name <laughs> and the jokes. Um, but no, so I actually threw up an Instagram question when we were taking notes on this just to make sure that we covered all of the bases. And one of the things that Josh and I both wanted to emphasize was being a quote unquote influencer was never our goal. We had aspirations and we had goals outside of Instagram and outside of this influencer content, social media world. And that is what I really wanted to reiterate was this was not a goal of ours. I know young people now growing up have that as a goal and they want to be an influencer and that's what they go to school for. And that's what they kind of model their entire life off of. And that for us, it wasn't even a thing. <laughs> Facebook when, <laughs> and Instagram wasn't a thing. When yeah. We were kids, yeah. Um, so that's, that's just one thing that I did want to reiterate. So I, Sarah am 30 years old. Josh and I's birthdays are actually two days apart, which is really funny in February. And fun fact, you share a birthday with my mom. Yes, I do. <laughs> so it's, it's a big day. Um, so I was born in South Bend, Indiana and my parents got divorced when I was five. So pretty young age. And then my mom remarried and we moved to California very quickly. And then we lived out there for a little while and then we moved to Texas and then eventually we landed in Ohio. So bouncing around, going from city to city, school to school, it really did force me to be a fairly outgoing person just because I had to make friends in all of those new places or my sisters were just going to be my best friends. And for the first few places in California, that was kind of, kind of the story was my sister and I, I have four sisters or three sisters. I'm sorry. Um, there's four girls and me and my sister, Emily, were very close still to this day, but definitely because we grew up friendless for a while because we had to make so many friends in so many different places. So I went to four different elementary schools, two different middle schools, and one high school. And my, my mom and my stepdad always said, when one of us was in high school, they wouldn't move. So they've been stuck up in Toledo, Ohio ever since because I started high school in 04, and now my youngest sister, Jessica, just graduated. So I was a senior when she was in kindergarten, which was crazy to go to her graduation, so. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, so when I moved up there, I moved up to Toledo in eighth grade. And as I'm sure a lot of people know, eighth grade is kind of a rough year, especially for a new person moving in. You only have a year before high school. So one of the things that my mom suggested was that I do summer classes. So that's one of the things that I did to hopefully make new friends in high school and just have a friend base before I got to high school because that can be a little scary. <laughs> new school, new town, the whole nine yards. So I say all that because I actually was able to graduate high school early because of all the summer classes that I was taking two different summers while I was in high school. And one of the really cool things that my high school offered was marketing class as a senior. And if you were in the marketing class, you got to leave early and you got to go to work. So not only did you not have to be in school longer, but you got to go to work. And that was really, really neat for me because I was super interested in marketing and that was my first exposure to it. And then my stepdad was the CFO at Masco Cabinetry and the president, Karen Strauss at the time, she was kind of my first mentor without even realizing it. She told me that she was the VP of marketing and then she got promoted to president. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is a boss right there. And I wanna do that. I would love to go into marketing. And I just started researching a lot of marketing jobs, a lot of marketing 
agencies, everything that I could get my hands on. And then my friend Caitlin was going into sports marketing. I'm like, well, that's really cool. I absolutely love sports. So that was like my first interest as far as like a quote unquote job. Growing up, I always thought I wanted to be a veterinarian just because I love animals so much. But I really just fell in love with the idea of marketing and knowing that I could market socks or I could market an NFL team. I could market anything just depending on the actual job that you got hired into. Yeah, that's so. a pretty universal subject, obviously. Yeah. So if you're listening and you're confused on what you want to major in, marketing's a great one. And then in high school, I played basketball and then I was heavily involved in theater. And one of the biggest benefits to my high school was that I actually took speed reading in high school. And that has helped tremendously, especially in my college career. So kind of transitioning into college. Oh, I did want to say. <laughs> um, By the when way, I, guys, I am super jealous of that skill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of my, one of two jobs that I had in high school, I worked at Coldstone and then I also worked at Abercrombie. So I had a great time leaving uh, halfway through senior year or senior day and getting to go to work and scoop all the ice cream. Is that where you got your big forearms from? Big forearms and I think a lot of inspiration for Bomber Nutrition Flavors, which is really fun. But that's a whole different podcast topic. But On uh, inspiration for yes, Bomber Nutrition. all the yeah, Coldstone sure. things. Um, and then also in high school, I was the copy editor for the yearbook and to the newspaper. So I am an absolute stickler when it comes to gra gra grammatical errors and punctuation. So I really have to edit Josh's oh captions quite a bit. Yeah, but I like to randomly I... capitalize words for no reason. <laughs> and I think that's Sarah's biggest pet peeve. Right. <laughs> so I originally was going to go to the University of Toledo. And then my ex broke up with me right before senior prom. Which, what a loser. What a loser. What a loser. Um, so <laughs> instead of going to Toledo, because I originally was going to stay up there for him, which was so stupid, I decided at the last minute to go to Ball State in Muncie, Indiana. And I was going to go for marketing. So I actually somehow got, oh, <laughs> hi, Jerry. If you're not watching, the cat just jumped up here. Um, so when I went to Ball State, I had my undergrad in marketing and I actually got my undergrad in three years. So I actually did a lot of summer classes as well in college. I did a lot of the prereqs and the classes that you're not really interested in in the summer. That way I could focus my actual school and my time on campus to the classes that I actually enjoyed and not having, and I didn't have to waste time studying or doing tests and going to class on actual classes that I was not necessarily interested in, but they were required for my major. That was actually extremely majors. impressive yeah. to me too. I mean, whenever I met you, that was crazy. I Thanks. couldn't believe you got your master's, but not only did you get your master's, you did it in 11 months. Yeah. I so don't think, I hope you all understand <laughs> like how big of a deal that is. Yeah. I mean, that is not easy to do. Yeah. And uh, very impressive. Thank you. So yeah, after my undergrad, I took my GMAT and I applied to a bunch of different schools in Indiana and I was born in South Bend. And so it was really cool that I got a accepted into Notre Dame based on my GMAT scores alone. I didn't even have to write a paper, which was really nice. And I also got to skip my 500s because I had a business undergrad. So I went right to my 600s for my master's and I was able to graduate with that in 11 months. And I was very blessed. My parents said that they would pay for four years of school. So I said, I'm getting, I'm getting as much education as I can. And I'm also super competitive. So my mom also has her master's as does my stepdad. And I wanted to get mine before she did. So <laughs> <laughs> she finished hers, I think when she was 27. So I finished mine when I was 22. So I always like to remind her of that from time to time. Jeez, She's listening. Kick yeah. some serious tail. <laughs> she was pregnant and had me. So she gets a little bit of leniency. But <laughs> right. what was really cool too during my master's program was I actually was a graduate assistant. So during my undergrad, I worked in a tanning salon. I was a test proctor. And then I also had an internship at the tanning salon on their marketing in the community and that kind of stuff. But while I was working on my master's, I was a grad assistant and I was teaching undergrad classes in the information systems operations management arena. So we taught, we taught um, Word, we taught PowerPoint, we taught Excel, and I really fell in love with Excel. And that is something that helps our business 
every single day. So that's pretty fun that I was able to teach that. And then during my undergrad, I was heavily involved in Pi Sigma Epsilon, which is a professional business marketing fraternity that specializes in marketing, management, and sales. A lot of colleges have it, and I highly recommend, even if you're not in marketing, to look into this if you're in college, because there's no better skill than to be able to market yourself. Um, I was in it for three years. I was a member year one, and then year two and three, I was the v- the VP of admin, and we just had an amazing time. It was amazing to make connections. We had corporate sponsors, and we had regional conventions. We had national conventions, and we just had an incredible time marketing our business fraternity and then also marketing to get funds to go to the regional and national conventions. So I Do you feel like you learned a lot in that, like that contributes to your success as a, as a I, business owner now? I feel that I learned in order. My master's taught me the most, PSC taught me the second most, and my undergrad taught me the third most. While my undergrad did teach me a lot, it wasn't necessarily as hands-on because mm-hmm. so many people, as you went up, obviously, in the programs, less people are doing their master's and less people right. would obviously get to their doctorate. So it's a, it's, a master's program is so helpful when it comes to actual real-world application. But then PSE allowed me to take what I was learning and also apply it to yeah, the, just really the organization. Is. Yeah. Well, I mean, d- were you part of fitness in this part of your life? I mean, what if you had to tie that in into your education? Because right now it sounds like you're just a straight up brainiac and no. marketing and yeah, don't no. do anything else. Um, as as not snotty, but I guess as like touty as it sounds, I didn't really have to study a lot in school. The speed reading really helped. And it was just something that I was super passionate about. And so I didn't necessarily have to focus a ton of hours on studying. Now, my master's is a completely different story. We had one test that took me 11 hours to finish. So that was a different story. But what was nice about the master's program was because so many people work and get their master's at the same time, a lot of our classes were night classes and they were only once a week. So it was really nice. We had a lot of free time. That's nice. But I will say that... It really, obviously I'm competitive. I wanted the degree, but getting out of school, I knew so many people had their undergrad and I wanted to set myself apart with degree. So I got my MBA. I got a, um, obviously master of business administration, but it was a specialty in marketing. You didn't have to declare a specialty, but I really enjoyed obviously marketing. So I wanted to take extra 600 level marketing classes. Yeah, so. no, I, it, yeah, it's, that's pretty impressive. Now, did yeah. you like know that you were going to do something with marketing in the fitness world or nutrition? I oh, mean, you asked you... me a question I didn't even answer. Yeah, so yeah, I so. was zero <laughs> percent into fitness, especially year one and year two in college. Um, at Ball State, they built a brand new rec center in between my year two and three. So they moved, they tore down the old one, and they moved all of the old gym equipment into the basement of the basketball facility so if you wanted to work out you basically had to go to a dungeon it was all concrete they had a lot of cardio machines and me and my roommate amanda we would do the elliptical and we had nicknames for like all the hot boys (laughs) that worked out (laughs) and we always went at the same time and then we would do the lap pull down machine because it was really not intimidating and we would do some ab crunches and then we would leave so that was the extent yeah workout programs by sarah (laughs) So cardio bunny. <laughs> cardio basically. bunny. We really just went to look at boys. And then we did some lifting. Nice. Flat pull down. That is just insane to think that that's yeah. where it all started. So, and then the rec center was completed in the middle of year three. And that was really, really cool. We kind of dabbled, kind of stayed close to the machines, but it was never a priority. It was always just having fun in college. We were very unhealthy as far as food went um a lot of gas station we lived right next to a gas station and we lived right across from a bar so (laughs) you can imagine (laughs) (laughs) and it was a very sad day when the hot dog guy passed away a few weeks ago so if that gives you any indication (laughs) on my quote-unquote fitness in college sarah eating hot dogs oh hot dogs pizza gas station snacks so when did it all transition i mean it's got to have a a turning point for you it does so i graduated with my MBA in 2011. High school was 07, yeah, college was 2011. My undergrad was 2010. And I moved back to Toledo and I had a lot of failed 
interviews. So I really wanted, if, if you're not geographically sound, Ball State is about 40 minutes away from Indianapolis. And so I interviewed at the Colts. I interviewed at the Pacers. And then 2012 was when the Colts had the Super Bowl. So they built this beautiful JW Marriott. And I interviewed there. And I also interviewed at a company called ADP, which does payroll services. And I didn't get any of those jobs except for the ADP one. So that was kind of a blow to the heart because I was like, oh, I have my master's. Anyone's going to hire me. Like, they'll be lucky to have me, yada, yada, yada. And it didn't work. And that was like a huge blow to the ego because I'm like thinking I'm like hot stuff coming out of college, three undergrad and three MBA in 11 months. Right, right. Who wouldn't want to hire Sarah Bacon? Like who wouldn't want to, maybe and it was the bacon. maybe it was the bacon <laughs> and it was just a lack of experience. And so that's, what's really hard is that uh, these, these companies want you to have the degree and they also want you to have the experience, but they won't hire you. So you can't gain the experience that they actually want. So it's a very frustrating market. And, uh, I actually ended up taking the job at ADP in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I moved there, didn't know anyone, um, was like three hours away still from my family and then also three hours away from my friends who stayed in Indy after school. And I absolutely hated it. It was a sales job. The trainers were terrible trainers. I use that term loosely. And I ended up moving back to Toledo because I just absolutely hated it. I stayed there a month and I couldn't take it anymore. My mom was mad. She had to move me that, (laughs) that quickly back. Um, And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was feeling very lost. And so I just got a job just to make some money. Um, I worked, I worked at Star Diner, which you've been there. Eggs and legs. Eggs and legs. It's like Hooters for (laughs) Hooters for breakfast. And I was done by two o'clock in the afternoon and I could just go home and I made some pretty decent money at it. So Uh, side note. Yeah. That's really good food, by the way. It is really good food. The waffles are to die for. And during this time, my stepdad, still working up at Masco, slipped my resume into a digital marketing agency in Toledo, and they had contacted me, and I told them that I didn't want the interview, and I didn't want the job just because I was Jay's stepdaughter. They reassured me that they get a ton of resumes, and they didn't want me to think that they were calling because of that, because they didn't owe Jay anything. So Hanson was the name of the company and they were the marketing agency for Masco. So Craftmade, Delta, Masco, Merillat, all of the cabinet and faucet companies, the high end ones. So Jay had my foot in the door, but I, like I said, I told him I did not want to get the job and I didn't want to get the interview just because of him. And they said, we get a lot of resumes. We, would not be calling you if we didn't really think that you were a fit. So I fought it for a while. I kept working at Star Diner and Frank would come in because it was like two minutes away. So he would come into Star Diner like every Monday. You're going to come in. Who's Frank? Frank worked at the digital agency. Yeah. And he he was like recruiting me at Star Diner. Yeah. And he came in a few times and finally I agreed and I went and interviewed and I was hired as an account manager for Hanson, which is a digital marketing agency. And I think now they have about 90 people. At the time when I got hired, it was around 75 people for an agency. Pretty decent size. And we did everything from website creation, app creation, website maintenance, social media marketing, kiosk applications, video. So everything in the digital space. So no print, no magazines, nothing like that. So everything was digital or video. And I worked there for about two and a half years. And in that time, I sat with pretty much every single day at lunch, just a bunch of dorks, (laughs) (laughs) self-proclaimed dorks who build websites, design websites and design kiosks and work on functionality of what's going to work best for a website and the best user experience. And we had an entire social media team and we had an entire team that taught Google analytics and companies such as company X. I can't really disclose any companies other than the one Jay worked for company X would hire Hanson to build them a website, enhance their website. And then once that website is enhanced, monitor it and say, okay, if we did two different home pages, which one's going to work best? And then based on that, let's update the website based on the user experience. And oh yeah, we want you to run our email campaigns. And oh yeah, we want you to run Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, 
we're going to give you the content, but you need to manage it and you need to be responding to people. So I really learned a lot in that job. I didn't necessarily work on the social team, but because I was an account manager, I kind of had my hands in all the different pieces of how a project went from an idea to actually implemented, to actually maintained, to actually make a profit for the company. So would you say for everyone obviously knows you have a large social media following and all this. Do you think that that following that you've gained came a lot from a combination of all of what you learned? A lot of that came from the digital marketing agency you worked for. I mean, if you had to pigeonhole, you know, where your skills really got developed, do you think a lot of that came from your job? I think a lot of it came from my job. I obviously post about things that I am passionate about. And then just a lot of trial and error. When I first started Instagram, I was so anti-Instagram, like, but oh, everyone, geez. I know. And there was a, there was a designer at Hanson, his name's Micah. And he's like, no, Sarah, you got to get on this thing called Instagram. Like it's just pictures, you know, like Facebook's getting weird with the candy crush and oh, the geez. political opinions. He's like, but this Instagram and I'm like, Micah, like, I'm not cool. Like I thought Instagram was only like for artsy people and photographers for photographers and, and people who, stuff, yeah. And yeah. so obviously Instagram and 20 end of 2012 early 2013 was much different than Instagram as we all know it today there were no videos no stories no stickers no filters no face filters no dms no liking of comments like it was just pictures and it was just comments and i captions and i don't even think you could comment back to people at the time individually like it no, was very no, weird yeah, it was, it was so rudimentary now yeah. that we think about I it. I feel like I'm talking about a fossil. And <laughs> yeah. I my first post was actually on my 24th birthday, and it was a cupcake, ironically, because I was just like, ooh, artsy filter, slap that Vienna filter on it. And, <laughs> and I'm, ooh, happy birthday. Um, So it's just really funny if you scroll all the way back. I don't recommend it, but <laughs> if you wanted to. First post was a cupcake, and I just started... So kind of backtrack when I moved home, my best friend, Lindsay, um, also was back in Toledo fresh. She was working on her master's at the time. And she's like, Sarah, like, let's just like, let's just go to the gym. Like you, it'll feel good. Like, I really like this one gym, LA fitness. I really like this gym. You know, it, it'd be nice to see you every day. Feel like that would be like a good way to see each other, work out. We can do whatever you want kind of thing said, okay, I don't really know what I'm doing. And she said, neither do I. So when we first started working out, there wasn't a lot of free content like there is today. It was a lot of bodybuilding.com forums. There was some people on YouTube in 2012, 2013, but not a lot. So we went to Barnes and Noble and we bought the big I think it's downstairs in the library, the big men's health book of workouts. I saw that. Yeah. And I where that came from. It was, it's very old. And we just would piece things together. Like, okay, we're going to lift, we're going to lift upper body today. And then we would pick like a shoulder workout, a back, a bicep and a tricep. And I'm like, okay, that's good. And then we would do like four exercises. We would dawdle a lot. There was a lot of talking in the gym, not a <laughs> lot necessarily of working out, but I had just started my Instagram and we were kind of in the gym and that was around the time when a lot of people were competing. Not that a lot of people don't compete now, but that was kind of the thing in 2012 and 2013 was, oh, yeah. was competing and it, it's huge at the time. And I found this beautiful woman on Instagram named Amanda Latona and she was competing in the Olympia. She was an IFBB pro and she was just very humble and religious and Christian based. And I've really gravitated towards the fact that she had this beautiful body, but she wasn't necessarily using it to gain the attention that she had. She was basing it off of her success. She was also Britney Spears' backup singer. So little known fact about Amanda Latona. What? She also dated a Backstreet Boy. I don't know, but I didn't know any of this. <laughs> I know. So I started following her and then based on her following, I started following other competitors and I got very interested in the competing side of things. And I was like, oh, this is like, if I want to do the fitness thing, like this is what I have to do to make it. And so I started competing and I did nine shows between when I started and when you and I did our last show in May of 2014. I competed in bikini. I never won a show. I think my highest placing was second place, second or third. 
Still pretty good. Still fairly decent. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have a coach. My ex was kind of like coaching me at the time, but it was kind of just like, let's get as thin as possible kind of thing. Bikini in 2013 looks very different than bikini now. And during this, during the shows and stuff, I was posting my journey on Instagram. People saw that my body was changing and then they were, they were starting to message me because I was actually at the time I was a dairy and egg free vegetarian. So I couldn't call myself a vegan because I was still eating honey and nice. <laughs> couldn't say that. Honey was the only thing that kept you from being Honey a vegan. was the only wow. declassification. And I was learning, I was immersing myself in nutrition and fitness. And people were asking, I was posting a ton of recipes too. And people were asking if they, if I could help them in their transformations. And I told them that I was not qualified to do so. I didn't want to take on that risk. But I also did want to help people. So I became a fitness nutrition specialist. And then I also became a certified personal trainer with no necessary desire to work in a gym. But I was starting to amass a following just because of the content that I was posting. And I wanted to make sure that I was actually qualified to be helping people. So literally from the very beginning of your Instagram, you were always value-based and not necessarily self-centered focused where you were trying to help people and help women. Um, from the very beginning. I think that's actually a pretty important note. Yeah. And I think too, like I mentioned, so when I started my Instagram, my sisters were still in middle school. I think one of them was in elementary school and I didn't want them to get the wrong idea of me. And I didn't want to put out the wrong idea of why I was doing what I was doing. So I really tried to keep it as PG as possible. And like I said, this was before Instagram had videos. So it was just pictures and there wasn't like layouts there wasn't like these fun themed days of workout Wednesday women crush Wednesday man crush Monday transformation Tuesday so it was just content and helpful content and if you go back through my Instagram you'll see that and I did share pieces and parts of my life as well but mainly the competitions and mainly the recipes and yeah I became a fitness nutrition specialist a certified personal trainer and like I said I was building this following. And I actually started working with Isolator Fitness in 2013. They were my first sponsor. And shout out to Dave. Shout out to Dave. I know. And Dave Almer owns Isolator Fitness. Yeah. And I messaged Dave and I was looking for, so if you're not familiar with Isolator Fitness, they make a meal prep bag and they have a three meal, a six meal, and then a bunch of other different sizes now. And I was going to work every single day and I knew I needed to prep my meals. And I was looking for like a, like a lunchbox essentially, but I wanted it to be a fitness based company and I didn't want to just go and get a cooler. So I was Googling meal prep bags and this company Isolator Fitness popped up and it was on pre-order and I'm like, Ooh, so I ordered a pink one, which I think we still have downstairs. Shout out to quality. And yeah. I, I bought it on pre-order. I think it came in October of 2013 and I fell in love with it. I brought it to work every single day. I sold so many people on it at work mm-hmm. and I emailed Dave and I said, hi, I'm Sarah. I have my master's in marketing. I have, I think at the time, like ugh, maybe a hundred thousand followers on Instagram. I love your product. I feel like we would make a great partner. I would love to go to work for you and show you what I can do. And Dave responded, and he'll tell you to this day that that was the best email that he's ever gotten from an athlete because a lot of athletes just say, look at me, look at me, look at me. What can you do for me? But my email came from a position of let's work and grow together. And in uh, 20... Side note, yeah. um, incredible email, by the Thanks. way. For all of you out there wanting yeah. to email Bummer Nutrition, why yeah. don't you frame it like that? Yeah. Because that's that, incredible. It'll work. Um, so in 2012 and 2013, I went to the Arnold strictly because my ex was a wrestling coach. And during that Arnold weekend, wrestling state championships is down there. So in between... Um, semifinals and finals, we would take the kids over to the expo and I had my first Arnold experience and Arnold in 2012 and 2013 looks way different than the Arnold (laughs) does now. And when I started working with Dave in late 2013, I just knew that working the Arnold, I just had a calling to 
actually be there and work with a company and work a booth and network. And I print it off. I went on Vistaprint and I made little business cards with my like <laughs> professional, um, stage shot, stage photo. And I was going to hand it out to like all these companies, like I'm going to make it, you know, and yeah. I never had the intent of leaving my job. I just really wanted to work with more companies in the fitness industry. And that was when Cellucor was huge and everyone was a Cellucor athlete and they, I don't even think they're at the Arnold anymore. So it's just so funny to see like the difference. And I asked Dave if I could work the Arnold in 2014. And he said, if you prove to me that you deserve to be there, which I love, I love that. Don't just give it to me because I have a lot of followers. And we were in mass on Christmas Eve and Dave called me and I told my parents, I'm like, sorry, got to go. <laughs> I have to take this phone call. And Dave invited me to work the Arnold in 2014 based on my sales. And it was just because I was posting it. It was before Instagram had story. I was just sharing it to my page. People were using my discount code and I proved my worth to Dave that I could actually move the needle with his company. And fast forward to Arnold 2014, went there, had an amazing time at the booth. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if you guys have never been, it's in Columbus, Ohio, first weekend of March. And I was also getting ready for the Pittsburgh show, which is in May. And on Saturday of that show, I had to find a gym. I wasn't from Columbus. I had to find a gym, not many 24 hour gyms in Columbus, not many open past seven o'clock either. And lo and behold, I end up at Lifetime Fitness in Dublin, Ohio. I'm working out and the rest is kind of history because that's how Josh and I met. So yeah. And yeah. I mean, again, she could have been at the club. She could have been <laughs> at the casino. She could have been a lot of places. Clubbing where, it up. <laughs> well, a lot of people and yeah. at the Arnold, that's what they're doing. You know, they're, they're going to the club. They're doing that um, on a Saturday night and you weren't there. Nope. You were at the gym. And so were you. Uh, so were I. So was I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of a very condensed version of my story. You know my story. Did I miss anything to kind no. of reiterate to people? Because I really feel like people... They see what we have, and we aren't flashy people by any stretch of the imagination, but they see the success of our businesses on Instagram, and we get the, how are you so lucky? I want to be like right. you. For us, what is seen now on September 21st, 2019, it's the granite countertops in a home. But what we really want to reiterate on this podcast is the structural foundation and the rebar that is put into us and the concrete and I'm using house references, but you people get the idea. <laughs> You're we, laying the foundation. I yeah. mean, that's, there's no luck involved with, with right. our success at all. I mean, yeah. you can see, I mean, you got your masters. I mean, you worked really hard. Did I miss anything? No. I mean, okay. the biggest thing is you prioritized, you know, work mm -hmm. and education. Yep. And, uh, I feel like you pretty nailed that a lot. If someone Perfect. asks, if someone <laughs> asks, uh, how do I figure out anything about Sarah Bomar, who she used to be? I feel like you kind of nailed it. Wonderful. Well, I talked for long enough, so I do want to introduce Josh, who is probably one of the most accomplished human beings I've ever met. If you guys have ever received an email from Josh and you've seen <laughs> his email signature, it's like 20 lines long. And that was the condensed version because I think Gmail capped him out. Oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't come with, without a lot of hard work. Again, Josh grew up on a dirt road, kind of a hillbilly, kind of still is. <laughs> but I want you to tell us all the accomplishments in between hillbilly growing up on a dirt road to winning the Arnold, to all your accomplishments in college, and then beyond. Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, as a kid, it's kind of funny. If you guys don't want me to spare the details, I won't. Um, <laughs> growing up, I was a hellion, to say the least. Uh, my parents and grandparents thought I'd be in prison. I was so crazy. So, <laughs> By the time you were 18. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was just a, a ton of adrenaline and, uh, and just energy. And, you know, I was super adventurous and uh, always into sports. And I played baseball and football. And, uh, and kind of in high school, I transitioned more to football and track. And, you know, in, in high school, it was one of those things for me, I, I, uh, was very lucky to have, you know, coaches that prioritize lifting and performance and, mm -hmm. and we had an unbelievable football team. And so I learned at a very young age, you know, on the, the solid foundation on form and training, but prior to, to high school, truthfully, 
I actually got started into fitness when I was around nine years old. And uh, it's funny. No nine-year-old should be worrying about fitness. I'm telling you, that was me. <laughs> uh, funny story is I was eating a bag of Doritos. Watching what flavor? Regular Doritos. Not Cool Ranch? Not Cool Ranch. Red bag. Yes, red okay, bag of Doritos. Gotcha. And my dad comes in, whitey tidies, and, you know, he's slightly overweight. And uh, I'm watching SpongeBob, and <laughs> you can picture this. This is a great visual for all of you. He comes in and his whitey tidies only wearing whitey tighties and he says son you're gonna look a lot like me if you keep eating those chips and he grabs his belly and he shakes it and i kid you not that scarred me for life and he said keep it up you know you'll look just like me and it was hilarious but yet so um i don't know moving for me because mm -hmm. right then and there that exact moment i made a decision every single time i watched tv that when a commercial came on i would do push-ups and sit-ups until my show came back on whether I was watching Spongebob, cartoons of any kind, um, that's what I did. Any adult can use that tip. Uh, to, yeah, by yeah. the way, okay. uh, commercials, BTW, yeah. <laughs> don't fast forward through them, use them as yeah. exercise. So I did that and I really started training really hard from nine, nine to 14. I mean, a ton of body weight stuff. My mom um, was really getting into Thai bow and working out and she's super buff. My grandpa was a big power lifter. And, and so I was getting surrounded by family members that were really getting into working out. And so I, I really enjoyed it. Push-ups and sit-ups until I turned 14. And then I was really packed on lifting the weights. And, uh, and, and at 14, you know, I became obsessed with learning about bodybuilding and, and how to become the best athlete possible. So I was reading tons of books and my mom would take me to GNC and they used to have books, God. books for sale. <laughs> and I'd pick out bodybuilding 101 and, and dieting for beginners. And, and I remember at 14, I was carb cycling for an entire month as a 14 year old trying to get lean and, and build as much muscle as possible. And it was craziness, but I, I was so obsessed with, being the best at, at that age and wanting to be the best football player and be the fastest track guy and and uh, and have the best quote unquote body and it's so funny to look back because back then it was my whole life and it's so interesting to think about you know how long ago that was but you know being that uh, that young age and learning a lot I and then getting into college or I mean into high school you know taking all that I was learning actually practicing it. Um, in the gym, you know, having coaches that, that taught me Olympic lifting and power cleaning and snatching and squatting. I mean, I went crazy when I got into high school because that's what the older high school seniors were doing. They were lifting hard and I wanted to start on the football team. So I was bench pressing and working out twice a day. I mean, it was, it was pretty intense. And I remember in high school, I got so strong at, it was my senior year. I squatted 455 pounds at 175 pound weight. Nice. Yeah, so I was pretty proud of that, and I think I bench pressed like 205, 305, I think was my best. And, nice. And I was super proud of that, you know, and, and I never got to three plates until college. And uh, Well, I was impressed, but now I'm know, not. I yeah. know, yeah. but it, that's really hard to do when you're a little baby. Um, but, <laughs> but you mentioned reading books, and I know, which I think some people know, but... Why was reading so difficult for you? Yeah, I mean, learning wasn't a problem for me. I really loved education. But, you know, like I mentioned, I was an extreme daredevil and all that stuff as a kid. You know, one thing that got me in trouble was my curiosity. And I was on the beach when I was eight years old. And I found this seashell that I thought was a seashell that was super interesting because I could see through it. And so I picked it up and come to find out it was one of the deadliest jellyfishes in the world. Um, a Portuguese man of war jellyfish, and it stung me repeatedly as I picked it up. And so I took off running, and as I took off running, um, I kicked sand in my eye, and I tried to wipe the sand out with the hand that had the poison on it, and it actually caused me to go blind in one eye. And uh, so you say reading, I tell you that story because when you're blind in one eye, reading is extremely difficult because most people don't realize it, but you read with both eyes. You know, one eye will read half the page and then the other eye will read the other half and you can read relatively quickly. Well, I read at half the speed because I had one eye. And so my one eye would get extremely exhausted because it would scan from one side of the page all the way to the other. So it would take me twice as long to read, but it, it, I, I just want that to be more of an inspiring story to tell you guys, you know, that, you know, I didn't hold me back just because it took me twice as long. Who cares? You know, I didn't, that didn't stop me from 
from learning and uh, my quote unquote disability, yeah. you know, I was like, you know what, who cares? It takes me a little longer to read. So what? And, uh, and that was for 16 years. Cause you got that fixed right before we got married. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And every year I'd go back and technology advanced every year. And I said, Hey, can I get my vision back? And they said, no, not yet. Um, the technology is not there. And then 16 years later, I mean, uh, I go in and they said, you know what, there's this new procedure where we can suspend a lens in your eye with no supportive tissue. And, uh, let's try this. And so, and it is as gross as it sounds because I watched that procedure in 3d. Yeah. I was yeah. like, they, they said there's a lot of risk involved. I said, who cares? You know, I'm like, <laughs> worst thing that'll happen is I'll still be blind. So let's do it. And the first surgery did not take, I mean, the lens settled weirdly and I was seeing double heads everywhere. It was really bad. Three days later, two, two Sarah's. Yeah. Two Sarah's, which yeah. actually wasn't a bad deal, right. bad deal for me. <laughs> so but, uh, transitioning the second surgery followed up. Um, did well and now I can see but it's a fixed lens I can't I don't have any focal distance or focal adjustment so you're half blind in college Uh, yeah all through college yeah but you still accomplished what yeah so um if we fast forward to college I think high school you know I was a prom king captain football team you did wear a camo tux I did yeah that is a fun fact (laughs) I wore camo tux if that tells you how much of a redneck I am yeah hillbilly there you go and I still won prom king it's pretty fun um but no as captain football team you know we went to playoffs that kind of thing Um, but fitness has always been a part of my life in in high school and going into college, you know, I had one goal, you know, I wanted to be an all American and an academic all American in the same year. And I was super, um, so uh, a lot of people don't know how difficult that is because they're not just like shelling out. No, I mean, to be an all American, you have to be the top eight best athletes in, in all of the entire nation. And to be a academic all American, you have to have one of the highest GPAs in all of America. I think it's like. They give out, I think, 200 um, academic All-American honors a year. And there's almost 50,000. Uh, no, and 500,000 um, athletes, oh, you know. So yeah. it's it's really difficult to become an academic All-American and all that. So I wanted that to be a goal of mine. And, and I told my coach that in high school. He's like, well, I think you better just stick to football and, and academics. Yeah, you could do that. But and I wanted to run track and play football. And because I just love track. Something about just turning left twice was super fun or three times. This is easy. <laughs> yeah, I like this. This <laughs> is fun. And I, I loved that the, there was an individual performance to it and a team atmosphere. And I, I just love that. And so I wanted to do both. I wanted to run track and I wanted to play football. And so I went to school. I finally found a school that would let me do both. And and uh, and to kind of keep going on the the journey of my life and into college, I uh, walked onto the track team and I said, "Hey, I want to run track." And I told him my times in high school, and it was so funny. He's like, "Listen, man, I don't I don't think you're going to uh, um, make the team. I don't think you're quite fast enough. But if you want to play and run, I mean, you can." And I was like, "Oh, don't don't you tell me that." I said, <laughs> "My my college story was literally not like any. I mean, the typical." Um, you're not good enough, prove me wrong kind of thing. And then I'm, I'm literally just the whole thing is how can I prove you guys wrong? You know, that was my story, but academics was also extremely important to me. I didn't go to school to party and do all that stuff. I went to learn as much as I possibly could, you know, and, uh, to do the best, the best I could in sports. I partied enough for both of us. We averaged out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you can ask anyone I went to school with. I never drank a single sip of alcohol. Um, Academics and sports was my whole life. And anything that that got in the way of me becoming an academic All-American and athletic All-American, I just didn't do, which included partying, which included drinking. And I know that'll alienate a lot of you guys out there and that upsets you, me saying that. But I mean, that doesn't have to be your story. That's just mine. And uh, it wasn't mine. So <laughs> and, and you're and you know what? You have enough raw talent to where you could get away with all that. But yeah. for me, I couldn't play in three sports, indoor track, outdoor track and football was uh, and trying to maintain a 4.0 was super hard. Yeah. And so, you know, I went to school and studied exercise physiology, uh, biomechanics, nutrition. I mean, kinesiology. I was just studying everything I could. A lot of stuff I was studying on my own, too, because I was just so fascinated with the subjects. And uh, and so I, I uh, kept working really, really hard. I was definitely the teacher's pet because I would go up. I'd finish projects early. And this is a good tip for all you guys in school out there. Listen to this. A learning tip. Listen to this. I'm telling you, this is good. I would finish a project a week before it was due, and I would take it to my teachers and say, what do I need to do to get a perfect score on this? (laughs) 
Oh my God. As a grad assistant <laughs> teaching undergrad kids, if someone did that to me, I would laugh at them. Oh, and then you would say, well, it's I right would say, now a C minus. I would say and- you can turn it in when it's due and you can't pull that fast one over on me. That's you must have a- just had twinkle eyes or something. No, yeah. they were so grateful for someone that actually cared. And so I, I would turn it in a week early and they would tell me, they said, okay. I said, would you please take a look at this and tell me what I got to do to get a perfect on this? And they would say, well, if you do this, this, and this, I said, okay, I'll do that. And I would do that and I would get a perfect. And I would do that in everything that I possibly could, projects, tests, whatever I, I had the ability to do that with. But uh, so, no, so to keep uh, fast forward, you know, I uh, it took two years, but I maintained a 4.0. And in 2010, I got academic All-American honors for the first time. And I was just elated, but I was not an all-American athlete. Mm. Well, I was impressed. I know. Yeah. I know, but hang in there. Okay, I'm waiting. Story's not over yet. On the edge of my seat. <laughs> you know, so uh, so I got, I, I joined the track team. Football was great. I started varsity and all that, but I, I definitely couldn't maintain playing football and doing indoor and outdoor track, so I chose to do only track. And uh, I, ran, I ran track, and I worked and trained like you guys wouldn't believe. And I ate enough food during this training program to feed an entire village. I mean, I had ate a buffet three times a day and then had an entire salad bowl full of chickpeas in between meals. Which is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. It was seriously had to have been a half a pound of chickpeas. Yeah, you should be arrested. It was high in protein. Yeah. So I mean, I was, it's disgusting to think back how much food I ate, but I wanted to grow muscle. So it took me two years and I packed on like 20, 25 pounds of muscle and I worked on speed and power the entire time. So I didn't just lift to be a bodybuilder. I lifted for strength and power. And so during those two years, I dropped four seconds off my 400 time and, uh, and ended up running sub 48s in, in the four by four, which is really, if you guys run track out there, you'll, uh, you'll appreciate that. But I went from walking on the track team to my junior year being a part of the nationally ranked team, which we went on to be the top eight in the entire country. And uh, I was the first leg of the four by four team that, you know, won or that placed top eight and became all Americans. Um, I split at nationals of 47, nine, um, which if you guys run 400s out there or know anyone that does, you'll understand that that time is very, very exciting for me. I'm very proud of that. Um, but also when I was running track, I threw javelin as well. I found I was pretty good at that. Um, didn't really have a coach that ever threw javelin. So I just kind of winged it and, um, naturally it was pretty darn good at it. And, and I trained to be a world-class thrower and a world-class runner. And for me, that was super hard because if you guys are throwers out there and runners, I mean, that's two totally different training programs, but I did both and, uh, javelin, all the chickpeas. I'm telling you, yeah. it must have been. <laughs> oh no, but uh, so in Javelin, I ended up um, breaking the university record that was held for 20 years um, and still hold that record today and uh, went on to compete at nationals, which I was the last person qualified to go into nationals. They literally had the, it was the regional finals going into neat regionals to make it to nationals. And I threw my very best throw and uh, qualified. And I was the last, literally the last athlete going into nationals. And uh, I showed up to nationals and performed my very best throw ever, breaking the school record and placing sixth in the nation. Um, and uh, that gave me double All-American honors. So that same day, we ran the 4 by 4 and I got All-American honors there. So I was uh, extremely excited. I just accomplished my goal as a junior um, to be an academic All-American and an athletic All-American in the same year. And I ended up doing it twice. And uh, that was humble brag, humble brag, yeah. <laughs> you know, two time all American over here. But no, I, I don't say that to brag. I do say that to tell you guys, you know, I was told that I wasn't good enough. And uh, I really they, they said that. I mean, it's and especially, you know, on the academic side, I had to work really hard for that. And, uh, you know, b- being book smart, and street smart, and all yeah. whatever, you know, yeah, it's, it's, I and jazz say, right there. naturally gifted. There it is. Um, all it didn't take me long to <laughs> study and all that stuff, but I still <laughs> got it for still got academic <laughs> All-American honors two years in a row. So that means I had one of the highest GPAs in America, and I was super proud of that. And I think that's important, too, because, you know, I do deliver a lot of educational mm-hmm. content on Instagram and, and different platforms and help tr- coach and train you as well. And so you're and actually qualified to I, do it. I'm very qualified <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, transitioning from college, you know, I, after that junior year, I was actually competing in bodybuilding um, through my college career starting in 2009. And I did bodybuilding, you know, men's physique wasn't even around. And, and I did like three, I think three shows or four shows. And uh, I got second twice, but I'm 6'3", and I was competing at 190. And and what was super, I mean, but I kept getting beat by guys that were 5'8", that were 190. So for everyone who's not in the competition world, there are several different men's categories as well as several different women's categories. Bodybuilding is based off of weight. Right. Men's physique. Men's is physique based. is based off of height. So, so for someone who's 5'3", 190, and someone who's 6'3", 190 looks vastly different, but you're competing against one another. Exactly. So I kept, I got second place twice. And then I, you know, obviously I'm not taking any steroids at this time because I'm in college and I, I mean, we drug testing. I mean, I'm in, in CAA athlete. There's no way I could do anything like that. Not even anything sketchy, like advanced creatine or whatever. Yeah. So I'm going up against guys that are clearly running juice and doing all this stuff. And so I just got jaded by the whole thing. I said, you know what? And for me to win, I'm going to have to pack on like 90 pounds of muscle. More chickpeas more no I was like I was gonna have to do drugs <laughs> yeah. and I didn't want to do that so yeah. I uh, decided to get out of it and and just focused on um, school and and track and football and like well, I left football but then um, that summer you know I went home this is where the story kind of turned south you know it's, so we're in between junior and senior year in college for you yeah so I went home on winter break and home uh, is in Mount Gilead yeah. Ohio at the time and I knew my parents were struggling, but I didn't know it was that bad. You know, 2008 hit the economy hard. My parents used to have, a, my dad used to be a master plumber um, and owned a plumbing business. Um, just a one-man show. My mom um, owned a construction cleaning company um, where she, her with a team of girls would clean a bunch of houses. It made, made pretty good money until 2008 and the economy collapsed. Mm -hmm. And the stress of that, you know, caused my parents um, serious financial damage in which it, it ultimately led to their divorce and uh, bankruptcy. So it was super sad. Um, and I was at college and kind of left them to deal with all this on their own, you know, and, and I come home and I realize how bad it really is. You know, they'd saved a ton of money. They tried to, and they tried to build a house on my grandpa's land, but they ran out of money. Um, and this is prior to the divorce and they ran out of money and couldn't finish it. So I come home and, and it's cold and it's cold win in the winter in Ohio, yeah. and uh, there's no heat running through the house or anything. We have a wood burning stove and everyone's camped out in the basement. You know, we were all just kind of living in the same room. Um, the base, they didn't have enough money to finish the upper basement until spring. So the upper floor. So it was a uh, pretty humbling experience seeing the vents shoved with blankets and all this. And we're all taking turns every three hours to wake up and stoke the fire. And, and I was just like, this is serious. Like I cannot go back to, to, to school or, or this and, and leave my parents like this and my yeah. family. Cause I ch genuinely love them so much. And I was like, I've got to do something about this. And so I go back to school and I finish and then I finish, finish that, that year, year yeah. junior year. And, uh, and I, and I come home and I meet, I'm home for a day, same situation, basement. And I'm like, I'm moving to Columbus. I'm going to go make something of myself this summer. Like, and so I get in my, my Impala, Whoa. black Impala. <laughs> it was a, a horrible car. Yeah. Um, but that's what I had. I had a full tank of gas and I went to Columbus and I drove around every single gym till I found one that would hire me. And uh, I didn't have a personal training certificate, but I'd been training people and obviously very educated from college. And I finally landed at a gym and, uh, and I go in and I'm just, I'm the hungriest guy in the room. I'm telling you guys. And I'm like, listen, I, I want, I said, I, I, I want to be a personal trainer. I said, this is all my, my credentials. I've been competing as a bodybuilder and, uh, I've been training all these people. Look at these before and afters I've educated. And the guy looks at me and I'll never forget this. He's like, you know, I'll hire you as a trainer. He's like, obviously you got to be certified. I'm like, oh, of course I'm certified. Totally lying. Right. Right. And <laughs> sorry, guy. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, guy. Yeah. And, uh, he's like, but honestly, I want you to manage one of my gyms and I'm 21 years old, by the way. And I look much older than I actually was and, and probably still look older. And I'm 21 at the time. And he doesn't know that yet. He's like, but I just had a manager quit at one of our gyms and I need a manager. I want you to train trainers. And I about fall out of my chair and I'm like, well, I, I really love personal training. I want to make sure I can do that because I genuinely love helping people and that physical, you know, 
change is important to me. He said, oh, you can do that too. You're just going to get paid more and you got to help trainers and train trainers. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You know? And I'm like, this is what I went to school for. I'm like, this is great. And I'm like, yeah, okay. He's like, all right, well, tomorrow you need to show up. Um, I said, because it was at the end of the day when I went there, he said, tomorrow show up with your personal training certification um, and a formal resume of some sort and uh, we'll get you hired. So I'm like, yep, no problem. Bring it tomorrow. So I leave there with no personal training certificate. And I'm like, perfect. Great. Now, <laughs> and it usually takes about six months to get one because <laughs> right. it's all self taught on the internet. You have to right. do it by yourself, online courses. So right. you had 10 hours? Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, what am I going to do? I have no money. Mm-hmm. I have a tank of gas. And it was the last gym I went to. So I'm almost out of gas. I mean, this was bad, bad situation. So I call mom. And I said, I said, mom, I said, I can take this test and take it without doing any of the training courses mm-hmm. and get a perfect job. I'm well, telling you, you went to school for it. I went to school for this stuff. Yeah. I sleep. This stuff is easy. I can do it in my sleep. And I was like, I was so confident. And I said, mom, I have to borrow some money. I know you're struggling right now. I was like, but I don't have enough to get a certification. And if you can spot me on this, I promise you as soon as I can, I'll pay you back. Mm-hmm. And my mom being the wonderful person that she is, she fronted me the money. And that was the only money I ever borrowed from my mom ever. Mm-hmm. And uh, she got me the money, and and I took the test and got a 98 on it. Nice. And uh, show up with a freshly printed certificate of a personal training certificate, <laughs> and I was all excited. Not and, recommended to go that route. Yeah, don't do that, Don't do that, way. unless but, you went to school for it, so yeah, there's that. <laughs> you will fail yeah. if you try that. <laughs> so I fill out the resume, and he finds out I'm 21 years old, and he freaks out. He's like, no way. I can't have a 21-year-old running my gym. I said, listen, dude, you got to give me a chance. I said, I will be the best manager you've ever had. Mm -hmm. And I'm hungry at this point because I got no money. I got family that's struggling. And I will do whatever it takes. And uh, so he's like, well, we'll try it out for for a month. He said, in fact, we actually have a competition going on company-wide on a free trip to Mexico if you're one of the top three salesmen um, in personal training. He's like, but good luck. You're, the competition's over in a month, and you're already a month behind. Everyone's got a month advance on you. I said, I'm going to win. And okay. he's like, yeah, whatever. You know, good luck. And, of course, my arrogance is coming across in confidence, but I knew no one could outwork me. I mean, I just knew it because, I mean, no one was going to put in the time I was going to put in. Mm-hmm. And so I get to the gym, and uh, and I'm just, like, super hungry, you know. And, and so fast forward, the uh, competition, I end up taking second place out of ever, all the trainers. I Not first. Not first. A guy beat me who ended up being one of my best friends in the whole world, uh, Chris Hammer, and and uh, so super funny. Uh, but he was an unbelievable salesman too, and I, and I just was super hungry. Uh, so I went, I go on the trip to Mexico. I get second place. I go yeah. to Mexico. It's pretty sweet and making some money now. I found an apartment, and, and uh, at the time, I found someone that would let me sublease that lived on campus and on Ohio State's campus because it was in Columbus. And super, super funny story. I said, I need 30 days to pay you, man. You got to believe in me. And I promise I'll pay you. And thank God he did. Yep. And uh, I got him paid and I had a place to stay for the summer. And you're living large. I'm living large. Well, I still wasn't making enough money to help family or do any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I just went crazy. I mean, I was working 16 hours a day, clo- open to close. I would not. I worked seven days a week and I wanted to the more training I sold, the better, the more money I made. And, and, uh, long story short, um, the company record was set at $10,000 in sales, um, in personal training sales. I broke that company record and sold $27,000 in wow. sales. Yeah. Pretty fun, fun story. But yeah. I ended up averaging every month what the company record was, which was around 10,000. And, um, I don't say all that to brag just to sh- tell you guys, you know, I was hungry. And, uh, and so that I started working there, but I knew, I got the job that I went to school for. So summer's over Yep. and it's time to go back to school. And I realized, I said, well, if I go back to school, I lose my job. Yep. And if I also go back to school, you know, I ultimately, I don't want to work here anyway. Ultimately, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to be a business owner um, because I wanted to, to, to make a massive influence in the world and yep. to help people. And you just can't do that for me, you know. I, I couldn't help my parents working a nine to five. And, and, right. and so I, uh, I, I decided I was going to drop out of school and you're, I'm not, a, I had a 4.0. I was an all American athlete and I dropped out and still got all that debt. Yeah. That came with, yep. Didn't mm-hmm. get a piece of paper yep. to, to make it all worth it. But yep. you know, I, I kept my, I got my job. I kept my job and ultimately I knew I wanted to be 
a, a business owner, but also I wanted to compete like full swing. Yeah. And men's physique came out around then, and that kind of started into my my uh, bodybuilding men's physique career. They it came out, and I was like, you know what? This is my thing. They're by height. And, uh, and men's physique wasn't super drug ridden. You didn't have to have this crazy monster body mm -hmm. to, to, to win. And so I was like, this could be my thing. So I really dove into competing and, um, and I started doing this while I was working a full-time job and I started winning a lot right away, you know, and I, and I self-taught, self-taught, self-coached. Mm -hmm. Um, I did have a posing coach that really helped, um, it's for sure. Yeah. And so I started coaching myself and, and uh, running my own diets and doing all this stuff. And, uh, I ended up winning the, f the great lakes competition show, which was my first men's physique show. And then I won the overall, and then I won Mr. Ohio. And then I won the overall Mr. Ohio, which for you guys that don't understand bodybuilding, when you win your class, um, you then go against all the other classes, all the other different height classes There's usually five or six. Mm -hmm. And then you, then all the winners compete against each other. And then there's an overall winner that wins the whole show. Whole kit and caboodle. The whole thing. So I won the overall of the Great Lakes, won the overall men's or Mr. Ohio. And then I just kept getting accused of steroids and it bothered me, you know. And so I went on to compete in the N um, NPC at Mr. Natural USA for like the best body and natural body in the right. USA and they drug test you if you win. Mm -hmm. So I went on and I won that class and won the overall at Mr. Natural USA, got drug tested, obviously passed. Yep. And, uh, and, and that was a big, big deal for me. So I got a huge ego at this point, you know, big, big head. And I'm thinking I'm unstoppable. I'm going to go win the Olympia and yep. the Arnold. And so I go to nationals in Miami and I'm stepping on stage thinking I'm going to win. And I literally don't even place like they placed the top 16. I wasn't even ranked in the top 16. You were in one of the number 16s at the way bottom. Of the oh, list. it yeah. was bad. Mm -hmm. I got humbled big time. I mean, these guys to go to nationals, you have to win a local show of some sort, qualify for nationals. And then to win nationals, you have to um, be one of the winners. So it's the best of the best in the nation competing against each other. And I was not the best. Um, I was far from it. There was a lot of great physiques and it, it humbled me big time. Mm -hmm. And so I went on and I used that as fuel. I never stopped dieting. I just said, I'm going to go and I'm going to compete at the Arnold now. And cause the Arnold was com a competition with, I mean, everyone from all over the world, yeah. you know, competing for the world's best physique. And so I trained my guts out and I brought the very best package possible to the Arnold. And uh, I stepped on stage against all these guys from the other countries. And it was so such a cool experience. I'm like complimenting dudes in the back of my, man, you got a great <laughs> physique and they don't even speak English, you know? And, oh, yeah. and it was, and I ended up winning my class and then won the overall at, at the Arnold. And that was just such a surreal, probably my greatest accomplishment in my life at that point was winning the Arnold, um, close second being an all American and stuff. And, and for everyone who isn't familiar with fitness shows, the Arnold is in Columbus every single year, the American yeah. show. It's the biggest fitness convention in the world. And then they also have NPC shows. And then they also have the IFBB professional show there as well, along with like 36 other Sports, Arnold's yeah, it's, there every it's year. It's a massive it's a show. Big deal. Well, so I won the show, and this is the new year. Mm -hmm. And I I knew competing was just costing me enormous amounts of money. It was not making me money by any means. I mean, I maybe sold a little extra personal training and had a little extra clients because I was a competitor, but not re not enough to justify Those plastic it. trophies in the office yeah. are worth a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, no, not so much. So I actually took that entire year after I won the Arnold the first time. Instead of taking that win and keep competing, I I literally took the rest of the year and built my companies. I was really trying to build Bomar Fitness at the time, my online training program. I was writing a lot of programs at the time, nutrition programs, fitness programs, documenting exercises and trying them out on clients and perfecting this and documenting this whole thing. And, and I started a program called Do It For The After Photo, which I was selling online. And it took a lot of work to build a company that I was trying to leverage my wins um, from. And winning the Arnold really helped, but it wasn't quite good enough because there were right. IFBB pros out there selling the same thing that had more credibility than I did. So that kind of weighed on me not being an IFBB pro, but I took that entire year, built myself a side business, in-home personal training while maintaining my my day-to-day -day job. But you also went and did a lot of business courses on your own as far as self-learning. Oh, went. yeah. So, you know, coming from a place where I had no 
business experience, no parents that had, you know, business like credibility, sales experience or anything. I went to over and during all of this, I was going to conferences and trainings every single week on sales and marketing. And I went to over 250 in uh, five years and yeah. over 16 major big conferences, but trainings every week and learning all of this stuff and, uh, and, it, and reading tons and tons of books on business and people skills and uh, sales and all of this. So I did all of this all at the same time. Right. And uh, I think which is important to know. But uh, so I, I, I transitioned, you know, um, into the, the following year, you know, I got a decent business going. I was making six figures at the time. Mm -hmm. And I said, I've got to get back into competing again. Mm -hmm. So I, the Arnold's coming back and oh, I just no. freaking trained mm -hmm. and trained and trained and dieted and uh, stepped on stage and couldn't believe it. I won it again. And uh, back to back years, it was unheard of. I don't think anyone else is. And now done. if you win the Arnold, you win your pro card. But at the time in 2012 and 2013, you yeah. did not. You don't win your pro card. So no. Yeah, I literally did not did not win the pro card, um, winning the the Arnold twice. But I uh, used that as fuel, and I just kept going. I competed in every single national show there was, and guys, that cost me an enormous amount of money. I spent. Yeah, you make zero money in at the NPC level, even if you win, even if you win your class, even if you win the Arnold, even if you turn pro, right. you don't start making money until you're winning pro shows, and even then. It's a few thousand dollars. Not it's not much. Even the Olympia is not that much money. No. So I literally spent most of my money on shows dieting. You had no food. money when we met. I had some, but not a lot. And it, I was literally spending so much money on food because I was eating like four pounds of protein a day because I was dieting for so long and I didn't want to lose any muscle. Should have stayed in college and had the chickpeas. I know. Yeah. I had a free buffet three times a day. <laughs> but so what, what happened was I started placing higher and higher at the national show. And then Miami comes around. It's the last national show. Of Redemption. The year. It's the show that I didn't place at mm -hmm. two years prior. Yeah. And it's the show that I'm showing up and I, they freaking was going to place this time. I was like, I'm going to bring, I brought my very best physique I ever had. I did so much cardio. I was as lean as a human could possibly mm -hmm. be. And I show up and believe it or not, guys, I went, I won nationals i took first place won nationals and got my ifbb pro card and i was beyond elated yeah. i won my pro card and a big motivator behind winning my pro card was actually to impress my future wife true honest god story i knew that i was going to meet my wife in the fitness industry because yeah. it, to win your pro card the amount of dedication and all of this the to compete and to diet for that much time. I mean, it takes a lot of dedication. So I wanted to prove to my quote unquote future wife that I was capable of doing something extraordinary. And, uh, and I know that sounds so cliche, but it's the truth. And, um, cause I wanted a smoking hot wife. I mean, come on. <laughs> and then after you divorced her, you married me. That's right. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. No. So, you know, I turned pro and at, at that time, this that's was the end of 2013. That's the end of 2013. And I leveraged that pro card like you guys wouldn't believe. I mean, I was the big king on, on campus trying to sell as much training as possible and in-home building, taking that and leveraging all my wins from Mr. Ohio to Mr. Natural USA to the Arnold twice and winning nationals. Mm -hmm. I leveraged that um, to sell training online and I was doing pretty good. I had a pretty large Facebook following. Um, they maxed you out at 5,000 friends, you know, but, um, you change it over to a business account yep. and blah, blah, blah. And I started Instagram and, uh, gained pretty good following right out of the gate, you know, just posting pictures of my transformation and my client's transformation. And, uh, that kind of transferred us into, you know, you when, know, going when we met to when we met, you mm -hmm. know, so the, I won the show in December and then the art, I think it's November, November. Yeah. And, yeah. I think it was at the end of November. Mm -hmm. Bye Jerry. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and the Arnold's that, that March. So yeah, three I, later. I go into the Arnold, you know, and I'm just walking around. I'm not competing that year. And, uh, and again, I went to the gym like Sarah did, yeah. uh, that Saturday night. And then her and I, I saw her at the gym and I, I had to, to hit on her. Well, don't ruin the next I'm not, episode. I'm not going to ruin it, but I wanted to <laughs> let you guys know we were both at the gym on a Saturday night instead yeah. of at the club or the casino, wherever clubbing it up. So I yeah. was extremely excited to talk to her, and I'm going to share the rest of that in the next podcast. But guys, I, I hope this di this didn't come across like I was just bragging the whole time. I, I genuinely hope that it came across from a sincere, just pure education of why 
we are who we are and you know and and why we have what we have it came from a position of super dedication and hard work not from a position of luck and just chance you know sarah got her masters in marketing and got a, a, an unbelievable job as a digital at a digital marketing agency and then constantly leveraged what she learned and applied it to her life and i went the the same route with a different story but hard work educated and uh, dedicated and I think that that's important to know that about us, you know, as a couple and, you know, why we accomplished what we've accomplished. It yeah. wasn't luck. And if you're coming over from Instagram, hopefully this also kind of solidifies that we are experts in the field, not just in fitness, but also in business and hopefully validates what we say. It's not just, we're not just quote unquote, pretty faces online. Like we've got, oh, we've, yeah. you think I got a pretty face? Me. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. We have education behind this and not only just in college, but post-college, you know, we're both fitness nutrition specialists. We're both certified personal trainers. We both have spent an enormous amount of time on personal development and learning yeah. our craft and diving into business and the businesses that we own. And those are all going to be different podcasts, but we did want this first episode to just lay the foundation of yeah. who we are, before we met, and then episode two is going to be all about who hit on who at the gym, <laughs> yeah. how we met, and how we started the businesses that we now have almost six years later. Wow, so, it's been yeah. six years. So we, well, thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And uh, as always, you know. What? What's well, the sign-off going to be? <laughs> I don't know. We never talked about it. Stay healthy. <laughs> Stay healthy uh, and enjoy the we're show. Gonna, we're going to work on the sign-off Yeah, that portion. was really bad. I, I want to take a shower. <laughs> that was really weird. Um, but no, we do appreciate you guys listening. Definitely subscribe. And if you could, leave us a five-star rating on the podcast.